Welcome to the first part of this Heritage Talk on Mercot Marsh and Foss Way. So I'm Natasha and I work at Wessex Archaeology. Um, I'll also be joined by um, a colleague from AOC Archaeology, part of Connect as well today. And these companies are both co commercial archaeology companies. And that means that we do archaeology before development happens. So that can be um, kind of death-based assessments, trial trenching, or it can be full-scale um, excavation works. So today, the, um, where we're looking at, it's going to be developed as part of HS2. So um, some of the other webinars later on, you might have seen Park Street yesterday, and we've got Coles Hill tomorrow. So today, I'm joined by Helen Shittuck from AOC Archaeology, part of Connect, and Emma Carter from Wessex Archaeology. So you'll be seeing um, Emma and Helen throughout the webinar, they'll pop up at different points. So before I hand you over to Emma for the start of the webinar, just to say this webinar will discuss human remains and a fragment of a human femur will also be shown during the webinar. Right, over to you, Emma. Thanks very much. It's not too grisly the human femur, but it is worth letting you know. So good afternoon and thank you for taking the time to watch this webinar today. Like Tess said, I'm Emma Carter and I'm a commercial archaeologist for Wessex Archaeology. So throughout our excavations along the route of HS2, we've been able to build upon our knowledge of Iron Age people and their lives. The Iron Age in Britain spanned from 700 BC to 43 AD, and through our excavations, we have uncovered basically what was left behind. So from those tiny seas to perhaps larger fragments like quernstone, so that's used for grinding grains, even things like butchered animal bones, ring gullies, all these pieces of archaeological evidence help build up a picture of the past. So we find the rubbish that people left behind nearly two millennia ago, that bin the broken bowl, the remains of dinner, bead from a broken necklace maybe, or the bones of slaughtered animals. But sometimes we also find more deliberate deposits that softly whisper tantalizing possibilities surrounding ritual and death. And through the ex excavations of Fossway and Mercote Marsh, we'll be uncovering the lifetime of a settlement. We'll also see how finding human bones in the foundation of a roundhouse is not quite as uncommon as we might initially think. So the first thing that we can see in this picture here is the mud. We can't escape it. So there's a lot of mud and rain on site at Fosway. And that's partly due to the site's natural geological substrate. So, and that is red clay. So the natural on this site is red clay. And clay, as we know, is great at keeping the land waterlogged when it rains. So just as the team of archaeologists on site would have struggled in the slick mud of the range, it's, it's pretty likely that the people living in our small Iron Age settlement would have experienced similar effects when the weather wasn't so great. Now, both the features we can see here are associated with the two structures as part of that settlement, and we're going to reveal a bit more information later on. Now, but with those structures, we also have um, roundhouses, so that's what they probably are, and also enclosures. Now, Enclosures can be any shape and use ditches, banks, or even fencing to separate one area of land from the other. Enclosures can also be used around cemeteries, domestic dwellings. They can be used to contain animals or keep animals out of a place. They also can be places of ritual and even fortification. So an enclosure can be many, many things in archaeology. So enclosure one, which is uh, what we have on site, uh, wasn't reve fully revealed during the mitigation. However, if the results of the geophysical survey are accurate, this is just a small enclosure orientated almost directly north and south and pretty much sub-rectangular in form, although it did have rounded corners. It was approximately 26 metres long and 18 metres wide, and all the slots excavated through the ditch produced fines mainly abraded, so worn down mid to late Iron Age potsherds, which Helen will be taking us through a bit later. There also some fragments and evidence of animal bone also. On the eastern side of the enclosure, the ditch had been recut, and that's probably due to, we think, to a localised silting event. So that basically means that the edges of the, the ditch, uh, perhaps there was a lot of water that day, and they silted in, and that's why the ditch then had to be redug. So much like how you get uh, farmers redigging the sides of dikes on uh, local roads in the countryside, similar sort of thing, but to stop the animals getting in or out. Um, in the recut, there's also a large quantity, again, of mid to late Iron Age pottery. So it does suggest that from this point, 
the enclosure is in use during a set period of time. Now, within that recut slot that was excavated, there were several fragments from a single vessel. And this may actually imply that prior to truncation, a complete vessel had been placed as part of a deliberate deposit, perhaps hinting at activities of more of a ritual nature. I have a quick question, Emma, about this picture as well. So um, when we're looking at this, how do archaeologists know this to be a feature? How do they know when to stop digging? That's a really good question, because it looks like different shades of brown, doesn't it? Um, brown and red. So um, what's interesting about this feature, and hopefully will help answer the question, is the profile. So we can look where those uh, the red scale bars are. If you want to figure out what an archaeologist has taken a picture of, look for the scale bars, and that's the clue. So we might be able to see from here, uh, as Tash is pointing out, where the scale bars are. We've got a change of uh, soil colour. So the natural substrate is that red clay, sort of a, a brownish red. And then in the section, so where the sort of the profile of the feature is, we can see it's a different colour and it's kind of a sort of a dark greyish uh, colour to it. So we're looking at the distinction between the natural geology and then the fill of a feature. And the fill of a feature is basically how uh, the shape of it got filled up with stuff. And that could be due to silting, as we've alluded to, or perhaps it was deliberately backfilled um, in something like a, a, a rubbish pit. But in this feature here, we, we know it's the enclosure ditch and the profile of it is really important. On that steep side, that will basically um, means that things can't crawl out but then the step side uh, does mean that if something does fall in it's got one way to go in and one way to go out so if you're keeping goats for example they're pretty naughty they can get anywhere or sheep actually as well um you would be able to limit them in that enclosure even if they could jump over the fence that's a good question tash yeah, that's very clever now the results that we'll go on to look at at fossway um I think are really, really interesting. So we can see here we've got um, two sort of roundish shapes, so structure one and structure two. I think the, the little footnotes on this illustration are quite useful in getting your eye in. So these two structures, we think that they are the roundhouses, and then the enclosure is down towards the bottom of that map. We see enclosure one there with those nice round edges. Um, and do bear in mind as well that the green lines you can see, they're not previous trenches, they're actually medieval furrows. But we're not looking at the medieval period just yet, so we'll forget that for now and focus on the lovely enclosures and the Iron Age results here on site. Um, so one thing that's important to note is that the enclosure did not form an element of a more extensive set of enclosures or a larger field system. It was isolated and discrete. So that's important. If you go, uh, again, we use the, the current agriculture and farming landscape as an example. If you go out to the countryside, you'll see lots of parcels of field and land, um, and you may see, and they may be counted as enclosures if they're walled in. This site doesn't have that, so it is isolated. So this is perhaps slightly unusual, as enclosures do tend to be integrated into more complex networks of ditch systems. And there are actually only a few parallels for this feature are known uh, in the Iron Age period, but there is a similar one that was excavated in the Arrow Valley in Warwickshire. And in this system, it was identified as a small stock enclosure. So these pieces of evidence help kind of support our interpretation so far. Now, the absence of internal features could also imply that enclosure one was a livestock enclosure, perhaps to corral sheep or herd cattle, as we've seen from the profile. However, in general, the ditch fields or stock enclosures are relatively sterile and only tend to contain small quantities of material culture because it's unlikely that you're going to be hanging out with the, perhaps the goats and the sheep and the cattle whilst having lovely pottery vessels. So the fields of enclosure one were actually really fine to rich and the quantities of pottery and animal bone were coming from all the slots that excavated through the ditches was quite high in comparison. So as all the cut features on the site were heavily truncated, so basically later modern agriculture comes in and plows it out, the fact that they contain fines at all is even more significant and actually implies that the domestic activities undertaken at this site may have been short-lived but potentially intensive in nature. It is possible that this small enclosure functioned for other reasons beyond controlling livestock. 
So the presence of assemblages of animal bone and pottery in the silted ditch sections could feasibly have ended up there as a result of material perhaps washing down the slope from the two roundhouses, uh, to, that's more towards the northeast, and hence be indicative of activities of a more practical nature. However, the limited paleo-environmental evidence remains, such as sea or grains, uh, things like that, that were recovered, where present, were very, very abraded. So it is suggesting that some domestic activity was present within the area, but this is probably not extensive. It's also worth noting that a flint blade from one of the ditches was of an early Neolithic date, and although residual, so it has come in there by accident, it does imply a background presence of earlier prehistoric activity in the wider landscape. So through excavation and environmental assessment, we can begin to build a picture of how the settlement might have looked. And in this reconstruction, we're looking at uh, structure one and structure two. So that's the main so the thatch building. So structure one is the, uh, is the bigger, more rounder, lower one, and structure two, the one with a more pointed roof. So it's worth noting as well that structure one is one of the interpretations that we've got. I might show you another one a bit later. So we can also begin to see the enclosure fence dividing up the land. So it's perhaps we can imagine that that fence there was to keep out some of the more rambunctious sheep or goats. Now, the second view, if you go on to the next slide, please, uh, shows more of the enclosure. And I can also point out where the uh, very interesting human bones were found. So if you look at structure two on the right, and we can perhaps just pick out the entrance, and so the entrance just lower down there, and it's not, not quite that pit hash, but if you go more towards the left, see where those numbers are pointing out? Down here? Quite got it there. It's, it's back on to the roundhouse and just to the right of the entrance. So that's where the There's human... The yes, just, just around the, there. To the right, so, here? Yes, spot on. And so that was found within the, uh, so the ditch of the, of the roundhouse itself. Now, to discuss a little bit more about those human bones, uh, we're going to go uh, on to Helen. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking, for you, uh, talking you through a few of the finds today. Um, and first of all, I'd like to talk about the, the interesting human bones that, that Emma's been mentioning uh, within structure two. Um, now, if we could move on to the next slide, I believe there's a picture there. Yeah, lovely. Um, so the, the bone in the image there um, is, is part of a human femur, and that's a thigh bone, um, along with other associated fragments from, from the same bone, um, all excavated from this gully around structure two. Um, all the finds we're talking about today have been assessed by archaeological find specialists. The bone from the site was examined by um, archaeozoologist Matilda Holmes, and this human bone has also been just briefly looked at by one of our um, resident human osteologists, the AOC, um, Mara Rieri. So you can see in the photograph there, there's, um, there's a large bone um, and a number of small fragments. And what you're looking at with the large bone is the top part of the left femur, and we're looking at it from the back as well. Um, osteologists can sometimes tell uh, the age of an individual from, um, from their bones. Um, a lot of the characteristics that osteologists would use um, and would look for on a femur like this are found at the proximal and distal extremities, that's the end of the bone. And you can see from the photo that those ends are, are largely missing. However, um, from the size of the femur, um, it can be said that it might belong to someone who was adolescent or older. That's still quite a broad range, but obviously really helpful um, in helping us to um, sort of reconstruct who this person might be. Um, people watching this might be wondering about how and why fragments of human bone have ended up in a gully surrounding um, a roundhouse structure. Um, but it's really important to note that people in Iron Age Britain often treated their dead in ways that are very different from, um, from the, the funeral practices we have um, in, in Britain today. So during, the most, during most of the Iron Age, um, burying whole bodies in graves was very rare. Um, cremations occurred at certain times in certain places, 
Um, but it's thought that some funerary traditions um, may have involved something called excarnation, that is leaving bodies out in the open until all the soft tissue has gone. And it's also possible that um, human remains were redeposited multiple times. So the bones that remain from these kinds of um, processes are often fragmented and deposited in places such as houses, ditches and pits. Um, so really finding this femur um, in the roundhouse structure um, is, is really exciting for us, but it's not actually that weird for the Iron Age. Um, so it's great that this is a uh, site obviously fitting into those wider Iron Age traditions. Absolutely. And to kind of further reinforce the oddness of uh, perhaps uh, burial practices in the Iron Age, um, we can look at another site that's actually quite similar and is just, I think, it's approximately six kilometres uh, away. So this site is um, Covington Woods. Thank you for watching part one of this Heritage Talk on Mercot Marsh and Foss Way.